record. We're recording now. Oh my gosh. Okay. So Hissy Fit 2021. Uh special guest, Pranas No oh, you got coming it right. to us. There he is. There he is. Uh coming to us to talk to us about mini comics. Ow, 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 ow. Um yeah, you know, uh, 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 putting together this lineup of special guests this week, you know, I knew I wanted to talk, get a, a web comics person, knew I wanted to get a, a, someone to talk about actually like print on demand and like stuff like that. And I knew for sure that I needed a mini comics guy. And I'm so honored to have Pranus come in. I think there's, there's really few better than Pranus to come talk to us about, about mini comics. Um, so thank you for for joining us today, Pranas. You're welcome. Well, glad to be here. Honor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, let's start off with a softie. Yeah. I like to kind of um, start all of these off with just kind of a, a get to know you um, with a comics origin story. Kind of uh, briefly, kind of talk to us about like why what why you wanted to uh, when did you know you wanted to create comics for a living. Well, um, I would say, uh, so when Star Wars came back out on the big screen in 1997, the special editions, I know hardcore fans are like, those aren't real, George Lucas ruined them, whatever, whatever. Like that was my, I've never, I didn't know what Star Wars was. Um, I, so I went in blind to it. Um, and I think seeing it for the first time on the big screen, I, it was like 11 or 10 and a half at the time, which I think is like one of the perfect ages to have that experience. Um, and it was one of those things that, um, I mean, I was always drawing, like I was like that kid in school, like, oh, fine, it's drawing me, it's like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and I like, you know, I like like drawing like sonic fan art and stuff like that, but like, and I love reading the Sunday funnies, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, but I never thought it was like, oh, I never thought of the people who actually made the stuff. Um, but watching Star Wars for the first time at that impressionable age, uh, as soon as the, like the Death Star blew up, I like, I knew I wanted to do this. I didn't know what this was. And I, I, initially it was like, oh, maybe I can make movies. Um, and then eventually like that, that organically transformed into uh, making comics um, and telling stories through that. And at first it started like with me, like um, making like little uh, comic strips about like me and my friends in like the fifth and sixth grade. Um, and then I got like deeper and deeper into it. Um, and then like, you know, I got into high school um, and learned that there was like a school for, uh, that actually taught sequential art comics as a major. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going there. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, thank you. Thank you, George Lucas. I'm sure you can see <laughs> my Jar Jar Binks. Uh, there he is. Crap all over here, but my, my Star Wars Binks uh, Pizza Hut box back there. <laughs> <laughs> wow so far as even collecting pizza boxes that's uh pretty impressive <laughs> that's 90, that's circa 1999 that's uh that's a classic well, that's probably older than than the students oh <laughs> uh, yeah oh yeah they i've caught myself being like you guys remember when and then it's like nope nope i have no idea <laughs> you weren't even born yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man uh well that's cool that's cool so then where do mini comics fit in? So when did you, where did you first learn of like what a mini comic was? Like, um, I would say, okay, so my trajectory in comics took a weird turn. Like when I started like, oh, I'm gonna make comics start like, oh, I wanna do like um, newspaper comic strips. And then of course that was around the time newspapers started dying off. So I was like, well, okay, I guess there goes that. And then I also wanted to like draw Spider-Man. So like, I, those are like two opposite ends of the spectrum, but like, those are like, you know, like mainstream, sort of stuff and that's like when I came to SCAD uh freshman year like that was still like sort of the goal maybe leaning more on the comic strip side but like that was that was the plan um and then uh might have been the end of freshman year yeah end of freshman year uh John Chad uh who you know well uh he came to me one day in the uh, SCAFE the SCAD cafe um and the like the student union was putting on like a a zine fest thing um, and he was like, hey, man, like we were like just starting our friendship then. It's like, hey, so I'm putting together like a mini comic table. Like, do you want to make, make some mini comics to put them on there? And I was like, yeah, sure. Go home, Google, like, what's a mini comic? <laughs> um, and then like, I you know, learned like it was like just 
you make the comic, you print it out on your own, you fold and staple and, and you can like sell it for a buck or two. And I was like, okay, I'm in. Um, and then from there, like, it's like kind of like changed my trajectory on the kind of comics I wanted to make. Um, a lot of it, which we can get into later, um, was just like the community of it. Like the, uh, the fact uh, that like everyone is working together. Um, we're trading our own comics and stuff. And uh, I, I think the poster is, but yeah, from the, my first fluke. Oh uh, in man, Georgia, that's a good one. Um, like that, going to that show with like my two or three mini comics at the time, like that kind of like changed my life. And um, that experience made me uh, re-examine what kind of comics I wanted to make. And that's when I decided, I think I want to make mini comics for the rest of my life, which, <laughs> you know, like there's not any money in comics anyways but mini comics there's definitely not money in that but you know it's it's uh it's like it's something i have to do it's like it, it's crafty it, it i feel like i physically make something once i'm done with it like and i can like the fact that i can like easily distribute it like a physical copy of it to people um i think is pretty cool so yeah it is cool it is cool um so from from here, let's let's get into the nitty gritty, right? So let's break it down for for people. Like, what what defines a, a mini comic? Like, what um, what is what does mini comics mean? Okay, well, so um, it all it stems from zines, uh, so, you know, the the punk rock culture there. You know, making like you basically your own self published magazine, like going to Kinkos, printing it out, um, and basically a mini comic is a zine. But instead of like words and bad poetry, uh, it's filled with comics instead. Um, <laughs> and and it, there's a wide range of it. So I have some examples here that I quickly show. Um, I have, oh, who, who's that handsome oh, fellow? Oh, snap. Uh, oh, that's one of the fur cultures. I've been sabotaged. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a big mini comic collection going far back and it's got some uh, Professor Fur Culture <laughs> gems in there. But like, so this is like the simplest of uh, mini comics that you can do. Like, this is like the simple fold and staple. You literally take a sheet of paper, letter size paper, fold it in half, well, print your comics in it, fold it in half, staple it, and there you go. That's, that's essentially a mini comic. Now, they can be different sizes. They can be tiny. Again, another. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so they can be different sizes. Um, so this one is considered a half size. Uh, this one is a quarter size. So it's like basically like this is like half a sheet. When you fold it, it's half a letter page. So that's why I call it half size, quarter size, because it's like a quarter of a sheet. And we go from there. And you don't have to do um, just. Uh, those things you can do different sizes like you can do square you can do big it's like <laughs> 11 by 17 it's technically a mini comic it was handmade self-published um so and, they, and then you can do different things um which i'll get to some examples later but they can be all over the place but basically it's something you print yourself you make yourself you assemble yourself um and you put out into the world whether it's like just literally throwing it at people, going to comic shows, selling it online. Um, but yeah, a mini comic is basically a self-published, uh, handmade uh, comic book uh, that you awesome. make. Awesome. So then what are some, some basics as far as um, how we can start making mini comics? What are some things we need to ha get, have, and, and things we need to like uh, know about um, making the, the mini comics? Well, first, you got to make the comic. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> as much as like, and I'll get into some of my examples uh, later on, but like, you know, I, I, the reason I guess I'm known for mini comics is because like, I, you know, make them like all fancy and gimmicky and play with the packaging and stuff. Um, but you got to crawl before you can walk before you can run. So the simplest way is you just take your sheet of paper, you print out your comic on it, um, and then you print it out fold it, staple it. So but what you have to do before you do that, if you want you want to make sure you get your page numbers in order. So I would suggest making a dummy copy. Um, so actually, let me get it. Let's say I want to make a comic. So I got, this is gonna be my dummy copy, two sheets of paper. Oh, where did I go? Did I? There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I messed up my computer screen. So. This is gonna be a simple mock-up, two sheets of paper. 
fold it in half. And okay, so I got page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I numbered my pages here. Now, as you go through it, you go, hey, it's in order. One, two, three, so on and so on. But since I haven't stapled this yet, when you take it apart, you notice on you, when you're laying out your comic, you have to put pages two and seven next to each other. And on the back of that, pages one and eight are going to have to be put together. In the middle, four and five, and on the back, three and six. So um, even though I've been doing this for a long time, I still always make a mock-up because there's nothing worse than like printing out your whole innards and then put it together and realize, oh crap, these pages are all mixed up and it's not in order. Um, so this is a good way to let you know like how you have to lay out your pages. Um, so that's the first thing you got to do to make sure it's going to actually print right. And then once you get that, um, you print it, you can either like go to Kinko's or I guess it's FedEx, FedEx office now, your home printer. Um, once school opens up again, use the SCAD printers, like you're paying a lot for tuition, get as many free prints as you can. Um, and they print out the innards. And then what you're going to do, you have like a beautiful stack of like your comics. This is called a bone folder. Bone uh, folder because it used to be made out of bone and, and uh, ivory, but thankfully now it's not because, you know, save the elephant. So it's like a more, it's a plastic now. But what you're going to do, what this does, see if I can get a, uh, I can't really see. I'll try to do this up here. So basically you take your bone folder and you're going to like, make a crease with the uh, the pointy end there. And then that's going to give you a nice fold. Now, stapling, the problem with a normal stapler is that if you try to go in the center, especially on the sides like this, it's only going to get to around here. So you could do, you could just like staple the edges there, but then it might be a little awkward. So what I do is I bring out this guy. Ooh, my, fancy. my saddle stitch. Now there's also a long arm stapler, which if you want to start with that, it looks like it's a regular stapler, but it's like a, oh, it, oh, Burke, are you going to bring out the long arm? Oh yeah. I, I never go anywhere without my baby. Yeah. So that there, that there have, is the long arm. I have my son and then I have my long arm stapler and these uh, I take care of. It, <laughs> oh, I see another one. I see another one up there in the, in the, the students. Oh yes. Yeah. Some students already know. Now this bad boy, this is if you want to advance up on the long arm. It's a saddle stitch because what you can do, you take your nicely folded comic, you place it right on the crease there, staple it, and then it gets it right on, right on the crease there. So this this is if you're serious, this is a a, a nice investment. I think it was only like twenty or thirty bucks, but saved my life so and then like after that like you essentially you have your uh mini comic it's as simple as that you, you print your comic out pull it up staple and there you go now if you want to go beyond that um and and how i think of mini comics now um i'll show off some examples now so how i started out with i started out very simple in fact this is my first mini comic uh grunge lobster number one um, I will never release it publicly because it <laughs> is, it's bad. Okay. It was my first try. Um, but yeah, so it's like, even the cover, it's like, it's just a sheet of paper. Like I didn't even like do anything interesting with cover stock. It's just a sheet of paper, black and white. You know, I sold it for a dollar. That's where I started, you know? Um, and then like the next few ones I did, like I started getting a little bit better with like a uh, different cover stock. Um, and actually a colored cover. So, okay, so it's not just black and white. So, you know, but still like these were my very uh, early works. Um, and again, a lot of people when they do mini comics, they just, they stop at the fold and staple. Like they might silk screen the covers or something or play with size, but a lot of people like that's all they do with mini comics. And that's fine. If that's something that you're into and you want to, you know, just do a fold and staple, go for it. Like I'm uh, everything else I'm going to show off and talk about, like don't feel like, you have to do it. Um, but if it's something that if you're interested in looking at a mini comic as like an art object, like the object itself is also a piece of art or like maybe enhances the story or something, it's something you could think about. Uh, but uh, uh, then again, like, you know, fold and staple is totally okay. 
Um, so should I show off some examples of Let's my do own? it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that would be great. Okay, so I'm gonna go sort of in order here. Um, and it's just a selection of stuff. Uh, so while at SCAD, I took a mini comics class, which uh oh, who was the uh who was the TA uh, for that one? <laughs> Kevin, who was, uh, was he was probably like the best looking human being that was ever created. Oh, um, I, I had a crush on him. He was a uh, <laughs> uh, jerk culture. Was that? Was that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it was you. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, yeah. So. <laughs> I don't, I don't miss that nickname at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like you know, that, as you know, Kevin, that many comments class. It kind of it was cool and started like a. Uh, I mean, there already was like sort of a a mini comics arm race happening in the department like john chad was doing like crazy stuff with mini comics and that people like me knickerbocker bullet um a lot of people who were in that class like we started like trying to outdo each other with our with our packaging and stuff um so this was the uh, first one i did with i silk screened uh the cover um and we could maybe quickly touch on what silk screening is later but it's essentially like uh an elaborate stencil um, and it's what a lot of like poster makers and, and people use uh, to print. Um, and a lot of mini comics people, they can use it to print uh, covers. Um, one thing you need to know is that every color that's on your uh, print, you have to do like one screen or one part of your screen and make a, a run for that color. So this is a two color one. So I had to do two runs on each cover. Um, but this one I think was the first one I did in the main mini comics class. Um, and it's just based off the Ben Fold song. Uh, and this one I put, and this is a lesson I learned. I put like this weird little flap here and Velcro, which, yeah, that's cool. It's a gimmick. But after I made it, I quickly learned like it didn't serve any purpose to the story. So when I reprinted it a few years later, I made it smaller and it was just a fold and staple. No Velcro, no flap, uh, but still silk screen cover. Um, but I learned early on, like, yeah, gimmicks are great, but you got to think, does it serve a purpose to the story or is it just, are you just doing it for the sake of a gimmick? Which sometimes that's fine, uh, but other times it's like, I mean, with how much work it takes to do these, is it worth it? Um, so from there in the same class, uh, this is when I started experimenting with um, the form of the packaging, maybe informing the story inside. So this was a comic I did called Boxcar Joe. And you can see the outside, it looks like a boxcar on the rails with a uh, open door and a little, uh, that's Boxcar Joe inside of there. He's a hobo, rides the rails. Um, and it's a slipcase. So I, I handmade the slipcase. Uh, the back also looks like the back of the, the car. And then the comic inside, you pull it out. And the way I did this one, it's like each page is as if you be cut away the wall um, and you're looking inside kind of like a like it's a play. Um, so in this case, I, I use the, the shape and setting of a boxcar to help inform the story on the inside. Uh, this one, Beard. Um, I started in mini comics class, but then almost broke my arm so I didn't get to actually finish it. <laughs> it started there in that class. Um, and it's a silk screen cover. Uh, only two colors um, because you'll notice like yellow is brown there, but I'm using the, the brown of the paper. So that's something you can do. Uh, you can use the color of the paper to be a color of your cover. So, and what's, so it's a beard and then you pull this flap down and his nose holds it and you rip off his beard. <laughs> um, so not only is it like a cool little thing to like bring you to the story and like, oh, okay, beard, no beard. Oh, that's cool. Um, and the, at the end of the story, spoiler alert, um, this guy, he gets this magical beard and he, he's an asshole with it. Like he's using it for bad purposes. So the town gangs up on him and they yank his beard off. So before you even start the story, you're already doing the action that's going to happen to this character um, at the end. So it's kind of foreshadowing. It's interactive. Um, when people see it on your uh, table at a show, um, they're like, oh, what's this? And they're like playing around with it. And a lot of times they'll buy it because hey, it's cool. Um, so there's that. And then uh, I've done some other stuff. Uh, like these are part of my, I did three of these in the series, my Monster Town series. Um, there's three books in each. 
each one is a face of a monster that it's the story's about, and each one has its own slipcase with a silk screen cut out and glue all by hand. Uh, basically take years of my life off doing this stuff, uh, but it's worth it. <laughs> As I'm doing it, I'm like cussing under my breath, but like when I have it, like a giant stack of them and go to a show with them, that's like, okay, that's why I did that. Um, and actually um, some of the, these are in the Library of Congress because <laughs> uh, um, this show, which once we have comic shows again, whenever that happens, uh, you should definitely go check out uh, SPX, Small Press Expo in Bethesda um, every year in the fall. Um, they do a thing where like uh, they pick a selection of mini comics uh, and they have a collection with the Library of Congress. So uh, one year I was honored that uh, they came to my table and said, hey, we want to put these in there. So um, as long as America exists, uh, these will be <laughs> preserved. So <laughs> preserved, yeah, in a glass case that's like airtight. That, it was know, actually like a yeah. one one SPX. Like, um, and I took my mom to see it because, like, look, mom, it's I'm I'm, I'm a professional. <laughs> um, they had a display. They had a display, and they had like um in one of those glass cases, and they had uh some of the mini comics in there, and um the Monster Town books were in there, and I was like. That's wow crazy. that's crazy they, they put them in the wrong way and i wanted to tell somebody that but i was like you know what i'm not going to be one of those people that's that's you know. <laughs> and then even um still doing like simple fold and staple stuff like this one uh this one i made um shortly after this asshole got elected <laughs> like you know dealing with those thoughts and everything um so the comic itself is a fold and staple but um it, it comes in like a slip case uh sort of thing. So even though I'm, I still do sometimes fold and staple, you know, I still like might play around with like slip cases or something. Um, or in the case of, where did it go? Well, I can't find it right now, but I have a comic called Glow in the Dark, um, which I use uh, Glow in the Dark ink on the cover because um, the story inside is about a boy using Glow in the Dark items to like uh, not be afraid of a monster who's under his bed at night. And he's using that as like a nightlight. So even something like that, like it's just a fold and staple, but oh, it's right in front of me. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's glow in the dark ink. So in theory, if this kid in this comic found this comic cover, he could add this to his collection of items he's using to uh, help uh, uh, alleviate his fears of the monster under his bed. Um, so you got to think about things like that um, when you're putting together at least how I think about it, when you're putting together your comic, like, is it just a gimmick or does it serve a purpose? Um, this one uh, is actually nominated for an Ignatz Award at SPX a few years back for Best Mini Comic. This is my comic, Laffy Meal. Um, it comes in a paper bag, so it looks like a fast food meal. In it, we have five different mini comics. They're all in the shape and size, roughly, of, uh, you know, what you would get at a fast food meal. You got ketchup, you got your little toy, burger, fries, soda. Um, and the story itself um, is that it's a dysfunctional down on the luck family going out to dinner at a fast food restaurant. Um, and each book is a different family member's point of view of that meal. So we have like the mom, the angsty teen, uh, the dad, the kid, and even the, uh, the dog who has to stay in the car. He gets his own little story. Um, and there's no order to it. Like you, the reader, you put pick these out of the bag and you decide, well, maybe I'll start with soda. Maybe I'll start with uh, the toy. Like there's no order to it. But once you read all five, you get the complete story of this of this dinner. And it depends, like I'm, I, have, I have had it on the table for many years. So I'm interested in how people perceive it when they come back and see me in years later. Like if they started with the funny one, does that like, how does that inform the rest of the story? If they start with the really like depressing one, um, does that taint the rest of the story? Um, and so, yeah, I like to play around with that, play around with packaging, play around with expectations, with um, the story that can be told. Um, and part of the reason I love mini comics is because you can do stuff like this. You can sell a bag of five comics. Like even if a publisher is really interested in something like this, like Barnes and Noble is not gonna have this sitting on their shelf. Um, because they can't, like if they do, they'd have to wrap it up and no one would be able to look inside and know what it is. Um, so, but this is something mini comics you can do. Uh, you can play around with the form and you can get away with it. So Pranis, let me ask you this, because you've got some like really awesome concepts with your work. Um, I mean, what comes first then, the concept or the writing? 
It depends. It depends on the um, on the story. Sometimes it is the packaging that will inform the story, and sometimes it's the story. And then I try to figure out like if there is a gimmick, even like what is it? Like for the Laffy Meal, um, this one started off as like I want to put comics in a bag and I want to make it look like food. Um, I actually did one sort of like a prototype story uh, called Sack Lunch, like a few years before this one. Um, I personally didn't like it. It was like, after I did, it was like, it's a fun concept, but like the story is like, whatever. But I wanted to re-examine the idea again. So I was like, okay, a fast food meal. What can I do? What would the story be? And then, you know, I, from there, I, I was trying to think of like, you know, fast food meals I had with my family and like, you know, fights we might've had over the McDonald's table and stuff like that. And then from there, I started building the story. And then I got to the point where I was like, well, if I'm having five different books, is there an order to it? Does there have to be an order to it? And then that inspired me to like, what if I tell like one story, one point of view at a time, and there is no order. So in this one, the, the, the form of the comic really dictated or helped determine where the comic itself would go. Other times it is, um, I, I just come up with a story like the, uh, like the unprecedented one. I was just like doing these comics on my own because any other comic I did in, you know, late to uh, 2016, early 2017 seemed pointless. Like the world's burning. Why should I be doing funny talking animal books? Um, so these were a bunch of journal comics. And once I collected them, I was like, well, I gotta, I gotta think like, how am I going to package them? And then that's where I came with the uh, bright orange paper and, and everything. So it, it depends. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it's the gimmick, sometimes the story. Like right now, the one that's in my head and I'm trying to figure it out, it's um, again, going back to fast food, but it's going to be like a burger. Like it's going to be like in a, a clamshell thing and it's going to have like, you know, each book, like the bun is a book, the lettuce, tomato, like each one's a book. I want it to be like a murder mystery um, in a food court or something, but I'm still trying to trying to figure that out. So, you know, it depends. <laughs> that's cool. That's awesome. Um, because yeah, like I, it kind of struck me early on, actually, when you were showing Boxcar Joe and you had mentioned that it's like a play, um, like playwriting is is some of the most uh, challenging writing you can you can have because the the setting always stays the same and it relies on the characters. Is that something that you're aware of? Like, have you studied playwriting or like you know what? Where's that? Yeah, a little bit, because um, I did uh, one of my minors, I had two minors, um, was uh, creative writing. So I did do like a few play workshops. But yeah, like, um, yeah, uh, having it take place in one scene is mm -hmm. tough. <laughs> like, yeah. Because uh, I mean, with comics and, and movies, like you can like, oh, cut to different scene. But a play, it's like you're you're there, you're you're looking at it. So um, yeah, that was like, a, I guess that was part of a challenge with the Boxcar Joe was like, OK, it, the story takes place in one setting. like how do you keep it going? How does it stay exciting? Um, so yeah, but yeah, it's a, it is a tougher form of, of writing because you're limited by, by setting. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, but it makes for just like a, a, a really solid story. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. And it's like what you were talking about, like that's such a challenge, like um, with Laffy Meal, presenting a story that could be digested in, any order but yet ultimately adds up generally into the same stories is something pretty magical like I think I think you're right like in order to undertake that like I, I think I, I haven't read it but I think like Chris Ware's um, building stories is kind of similar right like yeah where, Yep, yep, yep. Oh, there you go. You got, <laughs> you got it. I haven't cracked it. I've had it for years, but I haven't cracked it open because like, I'm afraid, like, it's like so daunting, but the yeah. concept, like this is this. And I, 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 I haven't read this one either, even though I have it, uh, John Chad's bad mask thing that yeah. put out a few years ago. Like the, it's like, yeah, like a bunch of comics in a giant box. And it's like, there's like a newspaper. There's like a magazine. Um, there's like a golden children's book thing. Um, and I feel like this is the closest um, mainstream pub, uh, publishing has ever come to like sort of getting the feel of what like mini comics can do. Mm -hmm. But like, it's, it's a tough thing. It's a tough sale too, because like, I mean, thankfully with there, you have a name, like it's Chris Ware. Oh, people know Chris Ware, but like, 
you know, unless uh, the store has a display copy that you can open up and look through, like it's all, it was, it was shrink wrap. You can't look yeah. inside, you know? Yeah. So you should have to know what it is when you get it. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing. It's too like the average comics buyer is gonna be like, what is this box? Like what, what, <laughs> what is going on here? But it's such a cool concept. And again, the reason I love mini comics um, and I, I do, I do professional comics too. Like I have to pay the bills, but like, um, uh, the reason I keep doing mini comics, even though it's more of like that, I wouldn't say a hobby, like it's still like professional work and stuff, but like, you know, the, it doesn't, won't, you know, it won't pay the bills. Um, I do it because you can do stuff like that. Like you can like experiment, be creative, be crafty. Um, and, you know, maybe the stuff you do there, maybe it can inform the more professional or, or uh, mainstream published stuff that you do, you know, with the mm -hmm. storytelling. Yeah. No, I, th I absolutely think they go, they go hand in hand, even if they may not seem related, or even if you're starting out with your own mini comic or zine for the first time, and you think you've got a long road ahead of you, just the fact that you're finishing something, yeah. no matter how basic it is, um, it's, it's invaluable to, in a lot of regards, you know. Um, yeah, like if you, if you make your first mini comic, and you go to a comic show, um, you're on the same level as everyone else there. Like, even though, like, you made it yourself, it's self-published, maybe you printed it um, on your school's printer, like, you're, you've made something. You made a physical object. And, you know, maybe, maybe it is crappy, like my first one was. I still made it, you know? And I, I started here, you know, and I ended up, you know here so you got to start somewhere but like you are on the same level as everybody else in that room because you have a book mm -hmm. um you have something you could sell to somebody you have something you could hand to somebody um when editors come to visit uh your school like you can leave them mini comics editors publishers they love that because they get to read these on the flight back home um and yeah you obviously give a business card but this is i would say better than a business card because you gave them a comic who doesn't like a free comic and, you know, when they're thinking of like, hey, you know, who, who uh, they're trying to look for new talent, maybe they'll pull up your mini and go, oh, I remember when this kid gave this to me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Also, make sure you include your name and your website in your minis at the very least. Okay. There has been many times I've come back from shows. I've picked up an amazing book. Like, oh, this is so great. I have no fucking clue who did it. <laughs> Put your name Put your your uh, your website, and if you're gonna put your email address, uh, don't be like Kevin and put <laughs> your oh, where, I had one here that had your your uh, your school address, your SCAT address. Anyways, don't put your student <laughs> address. Get a Gmail. That wasn't me. Was that me? I I, I, I found one of yours that had uh, the rest of them have like your hotmail, so that's fine. But <laughs> because when you graduate, your your email's gonna go away. Also, like you know, don't don't let people know you're a student. Let them know like, yeah, professional. You know, get a Gmail or something. Uh, but yeah, always include your name and your website for the love of God, please. <laughs> <laughs> that's some great advice. It was actually uh, uh kind of posed to me uh, by. Uh, James Lucas Jones, editor in chief at the time, he's now publisher of Oni Press, but he was saying the benefit of just collecting your work in mini comic form is it gives them a better idea of how you can control like page turns, what your comics look like in book form. Um, they may not be taking a chance on that specific mini comic, but it gives them a sense of what the closer sense of what the final product is gonna is gonna be. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, uh, it's, it, if anything, it's like a good way to just cut your teeth to even know if you can make a comic book, you know, because um, not many people can. Like they make it and they go, oh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great way to cut your teeth and, and uh, figure out what you're doing. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, all right. So I don't want to I don't want to skip if, if there's is there any other things as far as um, concept uh, as far as format goes that you want to cover before we jump into cost and pricing? Let me just I'm going to I have a selection here. I'm going to pick just a few to show off for my yeah. personal collection of, of stuff. So we already covered the simple fold and, and staple. I showed you some of my examples of, of, of packaging and stuff. I'm gonna show you some more, um, just a few quick selections of here and what you can do with, with uh, your stuff. 
So um, I could just spend a whole hour talking about my friend, John Chad. Uh, he got me into mini comics. He's the reason that era at SCAD, we had a mini comics arms race and everyone was trying to outdo each other because um, he was the king, all right? <laughs> like he, the, the stuff he was doing, like I, ooh, it blew all of us away. Um, it got to the point where uh, he probably got paid the most anyone's ever been paid to make a mini comic because um, Boom Studios for like three years in a row, like they had all the Cartoon Network um, licenses. For San Diego Comic-Con, they hired him, paid him a crap ton, I believe, uh, to make mini comics for the show. Um, and so with the budget that they gave him, he did stuff, he did stuff like this. This was the Gumball uh, comic. Yeah, it looks like a super NES uh, container. Open it up. We got our comic inside. And, and you know, it's like, uh, because it's inside the, the cartridge, he made it look like it actually, like it was a microchip that would go in there and even have the connecting points that you would have to blow on back in the day. <laughs> and then, and, you know, and then the comic is inside. And um, again, form and the comic itself working together uh the comic is about uh gumball and darwin going on a adventure like an 8-bit video game uh so you know the, it, it ties in with the packaging um what other ones we got here like this one like they can take different shapes like this is about uh by uh jackie lewis it's about a yarn golem that the character creates so the outside looks like a bundle of yarn even has like the wrap around that you would find in a store in. You just open and then read the comic inside. Um, there's cool stuff. Uh, my friend Beth Hetland here in Chicago, she has this crazy, like I don't know if this one's gonna translate well because but it's it looks like a pizza slice. And then you open it up at the circle and you read like the blue parts first, go all the way to the end. And then once you get to the end, you flip it around and you read the red parts, and then you get back to the beginning. So, like, you can have circle comics if you want. I'm still trying to figure out how, like, she folded this to make this work. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> this one is insane. Uh, Marcy Cooper. Oh, uh, yeah. Infinity Comics. It's a time travel story. Okay, panel one. Panel two. Panel three. Panel four. Back to panel one. And you can keep doing this over and over it doesn't rip the paper i i need to figure out how to do this because this this one yeah is insane um and just like you know playing around with like a, just something as simple as like a nice silk screen cover like sometimes you know that's enough to like you know up the ante uh, a little bit um this one uh drew and eleanor uh they are they were kings in the savannah scene and the athens scene um and actually this one i'm going to do a quick aside to tell part of the reason i fall in love with mini comics and my first fluke so first fluke a bunch of us pile into a car burke culter i think you were in the car uh was it motor's <laughs> car i was there <laughs> yeah sundance um so like all of us no sleep made the four-hour trip from savannah up to athens to go to fluke which was a it still is running um uh, at the time it was like in the the second story of a bar downtown um, and I was there with like my, my shitty little grunge lobster number one, you know, and it was a, the, the way it used to be, it was a first come first serve for table. So me and like 10 other people from SCAD, like we put all of our stuff on a card table. The show I learned what trading was like something in the, the mini comic culture, you can go around trading, uh, your comics with people. So you give them your comic, they give you their comic and uh, only if they agree to it, like don't try to take advantage of people. So I learned what that was. So I was like, oh, wait, I can get comics for my comic? Okay, sweet. Going around, passing it out, trading, trading. Um, and you know, I was trying to make tr uh, fa uh, fair trades. Like, okay, this is the dollar, it's cheap, whatever. Like, um, But then I went, got to Drew and Eleanor's table. Um, and I was friends with them. Like, like uh, they were, they're, they're, they're some of the nicest people in comics. Like, I love them so much. And Eleanor was there. Um, and uh, I was like, oh, and this is a bugbear had just come out, like, Oh, can I can I get a copy of Bugbear? And I was like about to give her the money. And I was also like, oh, also, you can have my my comic. Like I wasn't gonna trade, I was not gonna trade this for this work of art. <laughs> but Eleanor 
the sweetheart that she is, I was like, no, no, let's trade, let's trade. So she gave me this for this. Okay. And I, I, like she knew, like she knew it was like my first, uh, my first mini comic, you know, I was, I think it was a sophomore at the time. So, you know, still young in my scab career. Um, and just that gender, that like that generosity, that, that little spark, like it, that's what awoken that thing inside me. Like, oh, this, these are my people, like this community of like-minded people. Like we're all in this together and helping each other out. Um, and so now like I try to pay that forward a little bit. If someone comes up to me at a show and it's like, I can tell like it's their first mini comic, they're excited about it. Like they're just starting out, you know, I'm more willing to trade like, you know, one of my bigger things for it because maybe that'll be like what was with me, maybe that'll uh, like the spark in them to keep going, you know? So that's one of the many things I love about this world is, is the community aspect yeah, of it. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, the fact kinda, that she traded. Yeah. I, I have, I've got a s similar stories uh, to that as well. Like uh, s dealing with uh, Drew and Eleanor's awesome comics. And it's like, wait a minute, you're, you're just going to simply swap this does not make you know and you can't really talk them out of it either they, they yeah want. i tried i tried yeah 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 um yeah that's bringing back some some strong memories especially with that first venue for fluke um the venue now though i don't know if you've been to it uh since they moved to the 40 watt yeah i've been there uh, once since. yeah yeah that that venue is really cool really and it's got like a cool history to it as well yeah um cool all right so let's let's move turn the corner into cost and pricing things that we need to consider when we're we're selling our work because yeah we're wearing that hat too you are the salesperson and representative for your work as well what are some things that um you you consider when pricing your work uh well one thing i learned and i like to tell people starting off um don't undersell yourself and i know that's hard because you know us artists, especially cartoonists, we're all depressive, self-loathing assholes. Like, you know, like we see our stuff and we're like, oh, why would anybody like this? Ugh. I don't, I, I don't even feel comfortable charging anything for it. Um, get over that. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very tough hat to wear the business side of it. Um, and I'm not saying you have to be like, you know, like, you know, Wall Street about it and be like, oh, I gotta, you know, make a profit. Like, you know, you can, you have to do what's comfortable for you, but there are so many people, myself included, um, who undersell um, their stuff. Um, like what an example here. Oh, where did I put up? Another John Chad example. This was uh, Leo Geo, and I'll pull out quickly. You notice how it says, what's that say, $5? Oh, oh shit. I know. That's what you get for $5. Yeah. First of all, each, the bag is printed. This beautiful long thing. And so you get so many pages of content and like John Chad's stuff is just dense because he puts like so much detail into it. And it's actually like a pretty long, substantial read. Uh, you turn it over once you get through yeah. the end and he was selling that for five bucks. Yeah. No, <laughs> like uh, at the very least like 10. And I know, I know it's tough, um, especially like if you're starting off with these, like these you could keep like, you know, under five bucks. Um, uh, but I would say as you get... Put more and more work into it like if you're uh, silk screening covers if you're cutting stuff by hand if you're assembling slip cases by hand you know that that's your time uh that's your effort that's uh money for materials that you're putting into it so you have to take that into account um and yeah it is difficult um to sell things for a high price like like this i sell for 15 and i was like debating like uh 10, 15, uh, should I go 10? Cause I, I personally try to do um, in uh, multiples of five. Um, Cause it's like a weird psychological thing. Like people are more willing to spend a single $5 bill than four $1 bills. I don't know why that is, but so that, I mean, you price whatever you want to, but I try to keep around, you know, multiples of fives. Um, sometimes I might break that a little if I feel like it's in between, but that's why I try to keep it. But yeah, so $15 and I know some people, when they see this at a show, they think it's cool, but they see that $15 price tag and they're like, you know, I love it. It's really cool, but 
I can't spend 15 bucks on that. And that's fine. That's fine. Uh, there are people who will spend 15 bucks on it because they know they can appreciate the craftsmanship, the time put into it. Um, and the fact that like, I'm known for this now, like, so I do have somewhat like of a following. So people know what I do, which helps justify my prices. Um, but yeah, like it's easier to sell, uh, to make a hundred bucks, it's easier to sell 10, $10 books than it is to sell a hundred one dollar books. So you got to think about that too, because if you're going to shows, it costs you money to go to shows. It costs you money to table at shows, uh, to eat at shows. Um, so at the very least you want to like walk away from this, like breaking even, and that's not even considering, uh, the money and time going into making the books themselves, um, which is something you got to think about. Um, so I try to keep my, uh, costs cheap as possible. I would say the, the thing I spent the most on is cover stock. Um, but I try to buy it in bulk when I can, uh, to bring down the cost a little bit. Um, but I'm always like looking for deals and always stocking up. Like, um, here in the Midwest, uh, we have, I don't know if they're national, we have Dick Blick. Um, and, uh, whenever I know they're having a sale on paper, I'll run in there. And if I know what colors I need, like I will stock up, even if I'm not planning on printing anytime soon, I'm just so I have them. Um, but yeah, in terms of the insides, I, you know, I go to Staples, I get like regular, um, letter computer paper. I have my own printer um, that I use, um, I'm looking to upgrade it soon, but it served me well for the past eight years or so. Um, but that's you know, like, if you have to go to like a uh, Staples or FedEx office to print, you got to think like, okay, the cost of that, like how much is it going to cost to print enough inside pages to make like 50 or hundred copies of something. Um, and then you gotta, you gotta add that all up together, um, and see, okay, is this more or less than what I'm charging for the book? And hopefully that should be less than what you're charging. Um, and then again, like materials aside, um, you have to price yourself, like, cause it's not just the materials. It's also the work you put into it. It's also the comic itself, you know, like, like you need to give yourself value. And I know that's, I still have trouble with that. Um, I get down on myself a lot. Um, we all do, um, just know that that's normal. And that even though you think you're not good, there's somebody out there who thinks you're awesome and is willing to pay that five, 10, $15, whatever you're, you decide to charge. Nice. Um, and you mentioned, you mentioned it kind of briefly, I touched on it a few times just now, but you mentioned something called print run and, 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 and run size of your prints. Um, what is your typical print run for your mini comics? And in uh, tandem with that, like, what would you suggest starting out be a, 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 a kind of a, a tangible print run size for, for people? Um, I would say, like, if I had, a, if I had like a, a dedicated studio space, I'd probably do larger print runs. Um, but since I'm like doing this all in my uh, apartment, like I'm, I'm even the silk screening, like I, I'm ruining our kitchen table, like <laughs> uh, putting the, the, the screen on there, like in the clamps and everything. Um, but with the, my setup I have now, I, it depends also on the size of the show that I'm going to, because I tend to make my minis in, co in coordination with shows coming up, which I haven't made a mini in the last year and a half. That's why, because <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had shows, I miss some. Uh, but I would say, or I would average about a hundred. It also depends on the complexity of the thing. Like, oh, this one here, um, Ghost that I did, it's all 100% silk screened on a three foot long thing of fabric. This one I do small print runs of. I don't do it anymore, but when I did do it, I did small print runs of like 50 and under because it is a pain in the ass to do. <laughs> but you know, something like, like this one is a lot easier to do. It's just a three color uh, cover and then the slip case that goes around it. This one I could do like 150. Uh, so that's, those are the numbers I'm at. If I ever get like buy a house and have a dedicated garage or something to it, like I might move it up to 200 to 300. Um, for someone starting out though, I would say like, keep it very small to even see if you like doing it, like 25 to 50, you know? Um, and those are like things you could hand out to your friends or trade with, with other people. Um, Cause you don't want to do like a massive run of 500 and realize, you know what? I hate making mini comics or I don't like the comic inside or whatever reason. Um, yeah, like I would start small, see if you like it. And if you do like it and you do love it, then you can, start doing more and more and then you can like 
start playing around if you want to, like with your packaging and, you know, you know and cover stock and soak screen and stuff like that. So I would say, you know, do the simple, uh, just not, don't even have to worry about a, a nice card stock for the cover. Just do like, take a few sheets of paper, fold it, staple it, and, and see if you like it. That's, that's the first step I would say. But yeah, I would keep it low, like 25 to 50 for your first. And then that's see how it. people respond to it, see how you like it, and then you can go from there. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, cool. Yeah, the pricing is always something that I think everyone struggles with going forward. I think I think it's good to, yeah, like you note, like value the work that you're putting into it as well as materials. Um, materials is definitely the base place to start. It's like, that is a finite number. You, you should know, be keeping tabs of how much you're spending on what. Um, and that includes also your your Bristol board, your ink, your uh, stuff that you're you're using. Um, but yeah, that's like the base part. And then you kind of build from there. Um, you know, one thing that I was told or, or kind of I figured out uh, working at Dark Horse and seeing how those books were priced, it's typically three times the actual cost of the book um, is what you you price that as. What that does is it's not two times. Um, for very specific reasons, Sip simply because sometimes when you sell to retailers, you're selling that book at half price. Yeah. And so if you've only priced it at double, you don't make any profit when you sell to retailers. But if you sell to a retailer and you priced it three times as much, you still make a little bit of profit. That yeah. And, that, and that, even though it's not the same thing as like a, a big publisher like that, that is something that you still mm -hmm. have to think about with many comics because um, a lot of places, uh, you know, they will um, they will buy uh, your stuff and sell it for you. But usually, it's like they'll only give you half of what the cover is, mm -hmm. um, which is that's a good way to like get your stuff, you know, into stores and across the country, like little comic shops. Um, but yeah, if you're like already like your margins are razor thin, which I mean, some people do sell at a loss just to, in that case, just to like get their stuff out there, which. That's a choice you have to make if you if you're more if you're comfortable with that. But if you want to like at least like break even, you gotta factor that in um, when you're pricing. Like what would happen if I did sell like ten of these to uh, the comic store down the street or the comic store across the country? So you gotta think about that too. It's not a fun hat to wear the business side, but yeah, um, it, it is it is a necessary hat though for sure. It is definitely something that feels a little bit icky at first, like putting a a price tag on something but um it it's definitely um the more comfortable you get with that um you you you'll just it benefits you i will um, suggest this when pricing and if you're feeling like a little uneasy about pricing um and once comic shows come back open whenever that happens i miss them uh, <laughs> uh you can always go high and then lower the price if it's not moving. You can't go the, well, you could go the other way, uh, have it be low and then up the price, but that makes you an asshole if you do that. Yeah, if the word gets out, like, hey, I paid 15 for this and now it's, you know, that's a little. Yeah, so start high. If it's not moving, you know, like, you know, the, the last day of the show, you can be like, hey, Sunday sale, it's now $5 off. And maybe that's your new price going into the next show. Yeah. And also it's, it's always tricky, like trying to figure out like how many copies of something to bring to a show. I've been doing comic shows since, well, 2006. So, oh God, 15 years. Okay. <laughs> oh. Um, but yeah, this, uh, the ghost one, <clears throat> I, uh, one SPX I, where I premiered it at, um, I was charging only 10 bucks for it. In hindsight, I might like, cause it is like a very short thing. Like you can read it right there on your screen. Like that's the whole comic. Um, like I could probably get away selling it for 20 bucks but whatever i sold it for 10 um and i think i only had like 40 copies with me um that first spx were premiered it's a two-day show end of the first day i literally sold like the last minute of the show sold my last copy so i was kicking myself like oh if i had doubled the the run i could have you know doubled my sales and had stuff to sell on sunday Ugh. so what i did next year um i reprinted it i was like well you know what I sold uh, close, uh, 40 to 50 that year, sold out first day. I'm going to bring 100 with me. I think the over the course of those two days, I sold three. So <laughs> it's all trial and error. You never know what's going to happen. Every show is different. Um, just try to make your best guesstimate and 
go from there. Roll with the punches. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think um, with these small press shows, I think buzz has a lot to do with it. I think artists love to go out, like get something, and then go back to their table, and then be like, check yeah. this out. I got it over there, and then it generates a buzz. I think that's probably the case of Ghost, where it was like you had that buzz in that first one because it was new, potentially. I don't know. That's that's a theory anyway. But um, uh, I've only I've only had a taste of buzz one time uh, with uh, with one comic that I did, but it had a, it came with a whale that my wife made, um, and so I can't even take full credit with. with I had that one. I still have the whale somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was a fun show. Um, all right, Pranis, um, is there anything we might have might have missed before we go into storytelling time? No, I think I think we had a good overview of everything okay, that I right. wanted to cover. Let's before we go into storytelling time, let's open up to Q and A. If you have a question, um, instead of uh, 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 shouting it out or raising your hand, put it in the chat. And then we'll go in order of, of the chat, um, uh, just to keep things nice and nice and organized and, and clean here. Um, while uh, you are formulating your questions in the chat, let's do a lightning round, Pranis. Lightning round, what is your cat's name? Oh, I got two cats. Uh, this one down here, that's, that's Roscoe. <laughs> and the other one is Pixel. I can't let her in because she is a needy cat and she'd be clawing at my face because I'm paying attention to you people and not not her. Yeah, that that was going to be my uh, my my next question. Who's your favorite Star Wars character? Oh, it's tough. Don't steal it's tough. my question, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got to say, I think Ahsoka Tano. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah, yep. I see the happy face there. I was and I was one of the people when when uh, Clone Wars started in 2008 and it was like, I would love to be like, ugh, like Anakin has a Padawan. She's so annoying. Ugh. But then, you know, as the show goes on, you're like, she's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that she's appearing like now in like live action media and she's going to get her own show. And I don't know, maybe we'll see her in Bad Batch. I don't know, but I'm, I'm excited. I, I think she's what she's probably one of the best things to happen to Star Wars um, from the Clone Wars onwards. Like she's like, yeah, in that era of Star Wars, she's. Hmm the best nice all right my next question is um i know you're kind of a lego freak what is the favorite <laughs> what's the best uh lego set that you've uh put together what's the best one your favorite oh one? i would have to say oh i can't pull it down it's like up there in this upper corner here in my little endor set um yeah i have the uh the ewok uh village nice um, and it was yeah i got it for christmas one year and it, it like kind of looks like the old like kenner 1983 ewok uh set but now made out of lego um so yeah that's probably my one of my faves <laughs> all right awesome awesome and then um let's see uh one last one um uh what was for lunch today what, what's for lunch oh probably leftover uh tomato tortellini soup oh nice very very gourmet wow all right uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, uh, how should I go about getting into screen printing? Um, well, I would say once uh, your campus opens back up, um, try to find out like where uh, the screen printing stuff is. Um, I don't know. You guys are Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I don't know the layout there. I know um, in Savannah, you could go into the Fibers building um at least when we were there although i think they got wise to us now you have to be an actual fibers major to use it um but i know duncan did have an old silk screening place in norris but i don't know if that's well norris isn't even the comics place anymore mm -hmm. um but i would say get together with a group of friends and, and like first of all to help the cost and also to like to help each other uh figure it out because it is a very <laughs> very weird process and i've been doing it for like a long over a decade now and i still have times where i mess up um but like what i do is first of all i make my own screens like you just get um uh canvas bars at your local art store make sure you get uh two of each size so it's a rectangle or square if you want 
stretch, I stretch the fabric and I, um, the one I use is a yellow one. It's a 200 plus mesh so I can get fine detail. But if you're just starting out, just get the cheap stuff to see um, if you even like it. Um, or you can get, get a pre-made screen, like a cheap one to see if you like it. Get the, um, I would go look on YouTube for tutorials. It's, it's such an intensive process, uh, but I would say do it with friends. Um, and once your campus opens up, if there is a silk screening area, um, go go use it. Um, and maybe the maybe the professor there can help you or not. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things you either are going to love it or you're going to hate it. Um, and if you end up not liking it, don't force it. Um, let other people who love it do it because it is a thing where, yeah, if you hate it, you're just going to have a miserable time. But if you end up loving it, um, you are going to have one of the best times of your of your life. Yeah, you know, and and based on just. Uh... See, I, I have not a, attempted a, a screen printing uh, mini comic, and that's why it, it's basically, you know, it, it uh, I don't have a good grasp on it. Not well enough to where I'm, it's like something that I'm like, oh, yeah, I can just throw a, a screen printed cover on it. But I did take a uh, printmaking class during my time at SCAD. And what I came to know is that, you know, printmaking is... Um, you kind of have to love the process of printmaking. It's not, it's really never, it's really never about the final product with printmaking as far as an art form goes. It's more about the process and knowing the process and loving the process. In doing so, you do have a control over the final product, but it's really like, you know, it's some of the processes are really intensive, whether it's carving, or whether it's like scraping copper, or whether it's um, applying emulsion to the screen, letting it sit in the dark and drying, and then exposing it, you know, like it's, um, uh, it's, it's tough. expensive. And so you've got to really kind of... And if you uh, are getting into soap screening, yeah. um, don't get, especially if you're just starting off, it's probably gonna be a little wonky. Um, and there's, even if you get better, there's going to be like little variations from one print to the next. And that's fine. Like, um, try to embrace that. You know, some people actually, when they like are picking a con uh, a cover of a book they're buying for me at a show, like sometimes they want like the little like offset cover because to them it's like, oh, this looks more handmade because of this. And some people want that, perf their, that perfect cover and some people want the wonkiness, but like just lean into it. And I'm, that's something I'm still like coming to terms with. Now, obviously if it's like a really bad print, like one side's over here and the other side's over here and it's not supposed to be like <laughs> that one you toss that's one of your toss ones so we toss um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah like embrace it you know especially starting off um yeah and I, I would also just like find someone who already does it and like may, and shadow them next time they do a print run um mm -hmm. i did that with john chad back in the scad days and that's how i cut my teeth on that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also maybe some advice as well is start with something simple like a poster in a way where it's, it's you know, it's there's not another step after that. And you can really play around with registration, creating the screen, and then just having an immediate, you know, result there yeah. um, that you're not kind of beholden to like, oh, well, now I got to make this into a book. Um, but rather just make like a small run of like screen printed posters and see how that, that yeah. works. Yeah, maybe for the first time stick to one color because once you get to two or more colors, you have to do like a pass for each uh, color on there. So maybe start with one and start with like large shapes. Like, it, especially if you're starting with a cheaper uh, fabric that has a low mesh count because the higher the mesh count, the more details you can get on there. Um, and since you're not, it's your first time doing it. You don't worry about details, just do large blocky shapes one color and then go from there, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. Yeah, thank you. Super, super informative. It's hard right. to like put that all into like a five minute spiel. Like there's like, there's whole classes that can be taught on-, on uh, Right, uh, or a whole, yeah, a whole quarter worth of, of, of classes. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so um, story time, Pranas. What did you want to share with the class? Um, any, it could be, uh, you know, stories that have a, a, a moral to them, or give just... us the dirt on Kevin. <laughs> I was oh, trying I to remember one, one. I was trying to steer in Halloween. 
I remember one drunken Halloween, the uh, infamous uh, chicken costume, like that was made for what, a toddler? You just yeah. walk in the streets of Savannah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mid-drip, okay. all showing. <laughs> all right, all right, Friday, you're misremembering. Okay, I had a shirt on, but the, the costume only fit over my head. And, and, uh, and so I had a chicken costume on my head only. Uh, but I had clothing on everywhere else. Um, but yeah, uh, the Halloween in, in Savannah was, was a crazy time. Um, oh, yes, it was always a good crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, good. Um, now that that's seared into everybody's memory or, or brains, um, <laughs> I want to just really, truly thank you, Pranis, for coming and spending the time with us today. It's been an absolute treat. Um, not only hearing you talk about kind of things you think of when making your mini comics, but the, the amount of mini comics that you shared with us today um, was was amazing. And I'm going to be real with you, Pranis, when you sent me that outline uh, uh, last night, I was like, there's no way, there's no way we're going to cover it. But look, but look, we did. We did. I have to have more faith. I have to have more, more faith. It was a lot. I mean, I, I, I could go on. I could go quarter on them. You know, it's, it's, comic books are awesome. I love them. Like, yeah. it's in my blood. Yeah, no, um, uh, it, it, it shows in your work. And um, it's, it's always cool to see, like, what the new thing is that you're working on. Um, it's, it's really cool. Um, so, yeah, thank you again. Um, uh, anyone that's attending this, uh, make sure that you are sharing the links uh, this week, uh, hissyfit.com. The recordings of uh, these sessions will go up on the uh, site. There's already three up there right now. They're really awesome, really good. This one's going to go up later today. Um, and also, don't forget about the Artist Alley. Um, the Artist Alley has seen a lot of traffic just within this first week of you guys already posting the links. So keep it up. Um, it's been just a super exciting week. I never really, did not really consider that this uh, event was gonna go the way it did, but I'm, I'm really grateful to the special guests and to everyone sharing the link. Um, um, and it's what Pranis has uh, been uh, preaching this whole time. It's all about the community and everything like that. So you guys are definitely um, a big part of uh, making Hissy Fit. Uh, what it is. So many thanks all around. Um, and uh, look for, there's one more panel this week. Um, the, the last panel will be the, the end all wrap up of this entire event uh, with all three special guests, uh, Sean Knickerbocker, Mad Rupert, and Pranis Know You Kindness tomorrow at noon. So um, if you can't get enough of this guy right here, Come back tomorrow and get a double dose of your pranas. <laughs> I also just want to say um, to all the students, like if there's anything like you felt like I missed, or if you want to just hit me up with questions, like you know, go to my website, get my contact info, and you can shoot me an email or a message or something. Like I'm always willing to to help out the next generation. You know, like uh, yeah, yeah, it's all up there on, you. on, awesome. on the hissy fit site. Yeah, if you if you need to get the contact, just just go to the hissy fit comic site. That's awesome. All right, well, um, we're out. Oh.